the food hospital has opened its doors again. Last year, we proved that food can be a powerful healer. And now we're back, but this time we're pushing the boundaries. Using cutting-edge scientific research to treat a wider range of conditions than we'd have taken on before. And I'll be investigating what food does for all of our health. The Food Hospital medical team will tackle the diets of some of the UK's most extreme eaters. If you carry on eating the way you're eating, you might not get, get to, to this. And ask big groups of you to become human guinea pigs. Right, well, I can definitely smell. <laughs> <laughs> Asparagus. Stopping at nothing to find the amazing properties of everyday foods. Pretty incredible to think that something as basic as a turmeric root potentially can be cancer preventing. Using food rather than pills to treat everything from alopecia and acne to eczema and epilepsy. It's time to eat our way back to health. Tonight, the poo race. Which twin will win? This is where the poo race really starts. What are you doing? Are you bending over the loo now? <laughs> A family distressed by their son's eczema. It makes me feel helpless, to be honest. Like I can't help yeah. my own son. A young girl whose life is blighted by rheumatoid arthritis. What we do hope is that the anti-inflammatory diet is really going to have quite a profound impact on your symptoms. Go! And can a neglected garden vegetable really improve our sporting prowess? This series, we're more determined than ever to get everybody talking about the power of food. Tonight, we're looking at fibre, the stuff that keeps our bowels healthy. In the UK, a shocking four out of five of us aren't eating enough of it. The longer waste stays in our body, the worse it is for our health. So to demonstrate exactly how fibre makes us move, we've enlisted the help of identical twins. I'm Dean, I'm 30 years old, I'm a retail manager, and I'm twin one. My name's Mark, I'm also 30 years old, I'm a police officer, and I'm twin two. Dean and Mark have agreed to be our human guinea pigs and go head to head in what we are elegantly calling... ..the poo race. As twins, we're very competitive. <laughs> I like to win. I think you like to lose. <laughs> no, I like to win and you like to lose. Our twins don't just look the same. They've been eating the same reasonably healthy diets and tend to poo out the resulting waste at similar times too. Roughly at the same time in the evening, surprisingly. Regular as clockwork. <laughs> A healthy transit time is one to two days. Any faster and you're in danger of becoming dehydrated. Any slower and you're increasing your risk of developing bowel cancer. Our twins fall within the healthy range, but what happens to their transit times if dietitian Lucy Jones and consultant surgeon Shaw Summers alter their diets? Dean, twin one, we're gonna give you a low fiber diet. So you're going to have free reign on things like chicken, other meats, you can have things like dairy foods, to drink things like squashes, fizzy drinks. OK. Of your grains, everything's going to be white, white, white. There is no fibre in meat, fish or dairy. It's only found in foods that come from plants. Bread, rice and pasta have been processed and therefore have little fibre left in them. Can you live with this? I can live with it, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I barely, but yeah. Dean's new diet means his fibre intake will be cut to just nine grams a day, half the recommended daily amount. So, Mark, <laughs> twin two, you're chuffed to bits with this one. You're going to be having over 50 grams over of fibre a day. Oh, what have you done? <laughs> <laughs> Under the care of our medical team, Mark's been asked to eat two and a half times the recommended amount of fibre. Sudden extreme changes, like both these diets, should not be replicated at home. What you'll be eating, things like pasta or bread, you're going to be having seeded varieties, whole grain varieties, lots of fruit and vegetables. You can have fruit juice and smoothies, but yours are going to have bits in. It's going to be a bit of a struggle with less meat and more veg and more fruit. I think it's going to be quite tough to eat kind of all those foods because I've got a gut that will kind of feel guilty for not eating healthy foods. 
In four days' time, the boys will go head-to-head -head in the poo race when they'll be swallowing a smart pill to track the transit time of their stools. But for now, preparation. It means on toast. During this time, they'll be logging each bowel movement. Oops. And banana. And a couple of days in... Off to the loo. It seems our extreme diets are starting to have an effect. Here we go again, back to the loo. It's nearly two. Off to the loo again. Day two and Mark's on his fifth bathroom visit of the day because all the extra fibre he's eating has been a shock to the system. 8.15, back in the toilet again. A bit windy as well. Dean's poo chart, meanwhile, is looking rather empty, as is his toilet. This uh, loo might not be used very much. And I really hope get to see some movement, at least today. I'm not going to toilet every day. I'm uh, feeling a bit constipated. It's not ideal, it's not great. <laughs> Keep watching to find out who's crowned the winner of the poo race. Next to be seen by the food hospital's medical team is a four-year-old boy from Lincoln who has a condition that blights about one in five children in the UK. Jack has had atopic eczema since he was 12 months old and means that he often scratches his skin until it bleeds. It's a very uh, stressful to deal with to watch your son itching and damaging his skin each and every day. Sufferer's skin becomes itchy, dry, red and sometimes cracked and most commonly occurs in areas with folds of skin such as ankles and the front of elbows. Jack's been prescribed an array of moisturising creams and antibiotic ointments, but they do little to relieve his weeping, painful skin. There's never been anything um, that any doctor's ever given us that's, that's helped it, so if we could find something that did start to manage the condition, it, it would just be, it would be fantastic. As a GP, Gio Mileto treats many eczema patients, but Jack's case is extreme. So, do you want to tell me why you've come to see me today? Yeah. Why is that? Because I'm itchy. You're itchy? And you're itchy where? My arm. Yeah. And anywhere else? In my head. In your head. And what about your legs? Yeah. And your legs too. Can we have a look at your itchy skin? Yeah. And see where it's, where it's hurting you. Right. Right, let's take this off then. Oh, good boy. So eczema is an inflammation of the skin, and that is caused by some kind of malfunction of the immune system, or it's hyperreactive, so it's super sensitive. So to things in the environment, um, it can trigger this sort of thing. We know that it's associated with people who have asthma and hay fever. And you get this sort of rough, really dry skin. So he's got these what he calls excoriations, which is where he's been scratching, and the skin's actually broken down. It's bleeding. Mm. Right now, you've just scratched it, haven't you? It's very itchy. I mean, his bed covers and a morning is constantly yeah. covered in blood. Your eyes are so puffy, Jack. Do they itch as well? Do you scratch them? No, rub. You rub. rub them, do you? Yeah. Does he have sort of very severe reactions to things where yes. his sort of lips swell yeah. or his tongue swells? Yeah. <laughs> Eczema aside, Jack's parents have also noticed recently that when he eats certain foods, his itching gets worse. You all right, mate? Um, Your eyes hurt. Your eyes hurt. Yeah. Geo suspects that like one in three eczema sufferers, Jack has a food allergy, which is aggravating his condition. His parents' constant challenge is to stop him scratching. What are you doing that for? Wipe whatever's on your skin off. Wipe my chin. Sometimes, the only way to prevent him scratching his skin red raw is to use force. Just stop trying it, Chin. We'll <laughs> get to the stage where you're going to have well, probably going to have to restrain him soon. What made you feel like that when your eye, when your face has started to swell a bit? I don't know. You don't know. <laughs> not very nice, is it? No, I don't know what it is. No. 
<laughs> it makes me feel helpless, to be honest. Like I can't help yeah. my own son. I don't feel at the minute like he's, um, he's really got a real childhood at all. Gio wants to investigate if Jack really does have a food allergy, which is exacerbating his eczema. So what we'd like to do is refer you and Jack to a allergy specialist and get some information that I hope will give us um, some insight into foods that may be contributing or triggering his eczema. Which is a welcome relief for Mum Stacey. We do feel as though we've been taken very seriously today, a lot more seriously than we feel we've ever been in the past. Deep down know that there is something connected with foods and Jack's and certain allergies, so we would be really, really happy to do that. Two weeks later, Jack has come to London St Thomas's Hospital for his allergy tests. Let's take Jack through to see our, see our nurse. Let's do these allergy tests. Food allergies can be difficult to diagnose, as some people don't have a reaction till days after eating a culprit ingredient. But it seems Geo's hunch was right. Tests point towards Jack being allergic to milk. What we've agreed to do is have a trial of completely cutting out milk from Jack's diet because what I'm worried about is that if he is allergic to milk, um, then having it regularly in his diet may not be causing obvious reactions, but may just be chronically worsening his eczema. The home can be a minefield of hidden dangers for food allergy sufferers, so dietitian Lucy pays Jack's family a visit to set him off on his milk-free diet. So the sorts of things that we need to think about is one, replacing the milk that's in Jack's diet at the moment, because obviously for a young growing boy, milk represents a really important food. It's full of protein, it's full of calcium, which helps their bones to stay strong and supports growth. So we need to replace that with things like oat milk. And what I want you to do is to try and get a special calcium enriched one. Always look for that. You can also look at things like yogurt and dessert substitutes ones like this which have no dairy in and the advantage of this is that just one pot has nearly the entire amount of calcium that Jack needs in a day. Milk lurks in places you wouldn't expect including some sandwich breads, batter coated products, processed meats and cereal bars and Jack's mum wonders if she can still serve her son his favourite curries. What we need to start getting you doing is actually to go through the ingredients list. It should always have a little yeah. Acknowledgement. So, obviously, this one says contains nuts and milk. Yeah. So, without going any further, we know he can't have that. Most supermarkets now stock dairy free ranges and can supply lists of milk free foods sold in their stores. Lucy leaves Mum Stacy armed with the knowledge she needs to exclude milk from her son's diet. The next couple of weeks are likely to pose real difficulties for Stacey and Kyle. They're going to have to read every single label. They're going to have to change Jack's eating habits quite a lot. And I could imagine they could see some tantrums along the way. Later on, we'll find out whether cutting milk out of his diet is the key to improving Jack's eczema. I'm Dr Pixie McKenna, and throughout this series, I'll be identifying the heroes of the food world. From a cancer-fighting spice, to an ingredient that rivals aspirin for its blood-thinning properties. Sports and energy drinks have been the fastest-growing sector of the UK soft drinks market in recent years, and worldwide is worth billions. But wouldn't it be great if there was a food that you could take as part of a balanced diet that would enhance your performance? Well. Professor Andrew Jones from the University of Exeter believes he's found it. Be true. Three, two, one, go. Professor Jones has invited me to Portsmouth Velodrome, where he's in the middle of running a beetroot trial on some very fit guinea pigs. Hey, Andy. Hey. What's going on here? So uh, beetroot juice contains a lot of nitrate, which we think may have performance-enhancing qualities. So we've invited eight local cyclists to come along, and they're going to do a 4,000-metre time trial. But first, I want to know what the cyclists currently use, if anything, to enhance their performance. What's your secret weapon? Energy gels and energy drinks. Jam sandwich. Jam sandwich, yeah. fair enough. Okay. <laughs> so nice bowl of porridge. Yeah. Porridge, <laughs> jam sandwich. Well, beetroot doesn't seem so ridiculous then, does it? Over the last few days, half our cyclists have been drinking beetroot juice, 
the other half have drunk a placebo, which looks and tastes the same, but doesn't contain the nitrate. Today's individual times will be compared to the same trial they did a week ago when the drinks were reversed. In the science world, this is called a single-blinded crossover trial. So, will they be faster on the day they drank the beetroot or the day they drank the placebo? Three, two, one, go! Go on! When we exercise, our heart rate increases and eventually the body's muscles start to run out of oxygen. This condition is called hypoxia. If you can delay hypoxia, you can keep going at your top performance level for longer. Faster! Come on! What makes people potentially go faster? We think that nitrate acts on muscle cells to make them more efficient. Because on the track, we'd hypothesise that for the same effort, they may be able to produce more power, and more power would translate into more performance. The nitrates help oxygen to get to the muscles, therefore delaying lactic acid buildup. So is beetroot just a colourful salad ingredient or is it also a performance enhancer? Find out later. Next to be seen by the food hospital experts is a young woman who's in danger of being left severely disabled and who's already had to have five joints replaced before hitting 30. My name's Beth, I'm 29 from the Wirral. I've got rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease that affects well over half a million people in the UK. It causes painful swelling and permanent damage to cartilage and bone around the joints. It is most common in people aged 40 to 70, but Beth's had it since her teens. Rheumatoid arthritis is not the same as osteoarthritis, which commonly affects the elderly. I've had uh, both hips, both knees, and my right elbow replaced, and I'm waiting for my left elbow. There's quite a lot of pain in swelling, so still quite limited in the movement side of things. Beth still lives with her mum and dad because she needs help cooking, getting dressed, and even washing. I can go in the bath, but I have to be aware that somebody has to be in the house in case I do get stuck, because I get stuck quite often. I'd much rather be living by myself, because at 29, most people probably aren't telling their parents what time they're going to be home. Beth's meeting with consultant Shaw Summers. Just talk me through how the joints feel. Mostly stiff and sore. On each of the joints, you can see they're not normal shaped joints, not like mine. The knuckles are sort of sunken as the joints are being destroyed from the inside. Can you try and close a fist for me? Can't do it with those last two fingers. So if you were to grab my fingers, not a lot of grip there. <laughs> and that's why you drop things really easily. Yeah. The other thing is when you destroy the inside of a complex joint like the elbow, it won't straighten properly. Is that the case? How yes. straight can you get your elbow? That's straight to That's me. as far as it will go. Yeah. So that's actually quite debilitating. You can't yeah. then lie flat in bed with your arms no. by your side. It just won't go. So I get quite a lot of problems with my shoulder muscles because I overcompensate. Yeah. Um, so I've constantly got neck and shoulder problems because of it. So you know that rheumatoid arthritis is a form of your body attacking itself and it's part of a spectrum of illnesses where your own immune system, for whatever reason, recognises bits of you as being wrong mm -hmm. and it attacks it. And in rheumatoid arthritis, it specifically attacks the lining of your joints. And in so attacking those joints, the joints are destroyed from the inside and it's not only painful, but it stops the joints working. Shaw puts Beth through a body scanner to give him a better idea of how the rheumatoid arthritis has affected her body. It reveals that her body fat is double what it should be. Tests also measured her ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, which indicates how active her rheumatoid arthritis is. The normal range is between 0 and 20. However, Beth's ESR is 28, but Lucy's got a plan to reduce this score. Our aim from now on is to get you on a calorie-controlled, high omega-3 plan. And that's really going to work as an anti-inflammatory for you. Great. I have to say, I did notice from your food diary, a lot of red and processed meat. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because it's the polar opposite of what we're going to put you on <laughs> from today. <laughs> so this might be a bit of a culture shock. Saturated animal fats are high in omega-6, which when eaten at too high a level can actually cause inflammation. 
So Lucy wants Bess to cut down on many dairy products and fatty meats, as well as fried foods, biscuits and cakes. Because of her condition, Beth is unable to exercise, but Lucy hopes that the calorie-controlled plan will help her drop a few pounds. One of the major things that causes inflammation in the body is being overweight. So obviously we're going to help you with that as well, trying to bring your weight down to a safer level in terms of your rheumatoid arthritis and the pressure on your joints. And now that she's taken the stuff that's bad for Beth out of her diet, she wants to put some good stuff in. Omega-3 has been shown to have powerful anti-inflammatory properties. Oily fish is an obvious source of omega-3, but walnuts and almonds contain it too. We're also going to add in some herbs and spices, which are really good for their anti-inflammatory processes. So things like ginger, turmeric and cayenne pepper, they've actually been shown in studies to help reduce the tenderness and swelling of joints. Okay. So that's going to be really helpful for you. What we do know is we can't cure your arthritis. I know you know that. Yeah. It's not going to go away. But what we do hope is that the anti-inflammatory diet is really going to have quite a profound impact on your symptoms and your ability to cope in daily life. And I'm sure you could tell us yeah. just what that could mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This high omega-3 diet may be beneficial for other inflammatory conditions, such as psoriasis and migraines. When Beth returns to the food hospital in 10 weeks' time, will the inflammation markers in her blood have gone down? Identical twins Dean and Mark are four days into their eating regimes before they go head-to-head -head in the poo race, which will hopefully show how important fibre is for our bowel health. Twin one, Dean, like most of us Brits, is following a diet with a low fibre content, while twin two, Mark, is eating one high in fibre. OK, gentlemen, I brought your smart pills. Uh, now that their guts are accustomed to the change, it's time to swallow a smart pill, which will measure their gut transit time. Bon voyage. Your gut transit time is the time it takes for the food to travel from your mouth to the toilet bowl and the results will reveal how eating fibre can affect how fast food moves through us. Oh, I know how whereabouts is it. And when you go on one of those water slides, <laughs> that's what it's doing now. <laughs> <laughs> I think my transit time is going to be shorter uh, than it was before. I'm going to probably ding, thrash that. Ding, 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 ding. It's going down. I don't feel as confident that I'll win it uh, with the diet that I'm on, but I hope I'll win it. Best man win. That's yeah. me, of course. Indeed. See you later. Ciao, bro. Now it's a waiting game to see whose pill will hit the toilet bowl first. Making them the official winner of the poo race. What are you doing? Are you bending over the loo now? <laughs> it's got that bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going. You're going? going. What, where are you going now, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what you're bent over. <laughs> A few days later, it's time for the twins to meet Lucy and Shaw to get their results. So you've had the high fibre diet. Yes. What's that been like? This is my chart here. So that's normal you. Yep. And then something happened. It got a little here. bit... <laughs> Monday was a particular bad day. Mark, in fact, pooed 19 times in seven days. You, on the other hand. Yeah, I've, uh, I've, I've, I've had the student diet, as I like to call it. Yeah. <laughs> Literally, it was like adding a layer to a layer to a layer, and you can almost feel it like coming up the stomach and thinking, so you I'm didn't digesting this at all. So it wasn't moving on. It wasn't moving on. In one week, Dean pooed just four times. And of course, your, your types of stools have changed. They have, yeah. So they have become a lot harder, a lot more robust. Are they more difficult to pass? They, they are, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We've had the results back from the lab. Interestingly, Mark, high fibre, because your bowels were fairly healthy anyway, actually, <laughs> there hasn't that. been a huge difference. High fibre Mark's transit time is 35 hours, which is within the healthy gut transit time of one to two days. However, the average gut transit time in the UK is a much longer two to three days, thanks largely to the lack of fibre in our diets, which moves us on to low fibre Dean. Dean, I'm afraid we're going to have to disqualify you. Do you know why? Why is that? Because the smart pill's still oh, in no, there. Is that it? <laughs> <laughs> it's still inside. It's yeah, still yeah. There. So Dean's at 52 hours and counting. 
Removing just five grams of fiber a day from his diet has so far added almost 20 hours to his transit time. It just goes to show that changing a diet and removing the fiber has a mm. profound effect. The twin smart pills were neck and neck as they traveled through their stomachs and intestines. But when they reached the colon, everything changed. This is where the poo race really starts. It's in the colon that fiber really comes into its own. It's the fiber in our diet that helps food pass through our colon by adding bulk to our stools. It gives the colon something to squeeze by a process called peristalsis, and that's where the wall of the colon squeezes on itself and whatever's inside gets pushed along. Dean, because your diet is so low in fibre, there's nothing to push the smart pill round. Stagnant stools are high in toxins, and the longer they hang around in the colon, the greater the chance of them causing damage, which can lead to some serious health problems. A study in the British Medical Journal has found that a diet high in fibre can reduce your risk of developing bowel cancer by up to 20%. Foods highest in fibre are whole grain breads, pasta and rice, as well as fruit and vegetables. So guys, you finished the poo race, and I have to say, Mark, congratulations. Thank you, you very much. You win by a Thank fairly you, wide much. margin. In Thank fact, you. we're not even sure how wide that margin <laughs> is. <yet. laughs> it was 59 hours before Dean eventually passed his smart pill. When it came to testing the effects of fibre, Dean and Mark went beyond the call of duty. Now we want you guys at home to get involved. But don't worry, you won't have to go to such extremes. When it comes to talking about poo, it seems that us Brits are more than a bit squeamish. A recent Department of Health campaign revealed that one in three people are too embarrassed to talk to their doctor about their bowel movements, even though our poo can tell us a lot about our health. The quality and type of your stools, that's poo to you and me, is a sure indicator of how well your insides are working, and yet very few of us know what's normal. Only half of people invited by the NHS to be screened for bowel cancer take up the opportunity. But if more people did, they would increase their chance of survival by up to 90%, and screening would save a phenomenal 2,000 lives a year. Still to come, an extreme eater who's terrified of fruit and veg. That's what we call scurvy, and unfortunately you're recreating that in your own little world. Beth returns to the food hospital, but has the diet worked? Actually, the diet has made a change to your blood test results. And for four-year-old Jack, the road to recovery is anything but smooth. Oh, your tummy! Your tummy. The food hospital doesn't just treat illnesses, it also treats extreme eaters, people whose weird dietary habits have left the medical team concerned for their health. Tonight, a man who is terrified of fruit and veg. My name's Adam Clark. I'm 22 years old. I'm from Manchester, and the reason I'm here today is because I'm a fussy eater. Fussy is an understatement. Adam lives on just six foods, chicken nuggets, chips, pizza, crisps, cheese on toast, and chocolate. He's scared to go out for dinner because of his vegetable phobia. And on the few times he's tried vegetables, his heart races and he gags. The last time I tried a veg was probably about a year or two ago and it was broccoli and I ran upstairs and spat it out and was sick. <laughs> Desperate to fight the food phobia that's stopping him enjoying life to the full, Adam's seeing Lucy and Shaw. How have you led to such a restricted diet? I was quite, like badly bullied at school and obviously when I was at school I just wanted to get home and I was look I looked forward to my mum cooking me, me tea and everything mm -hmm. and I used to just have the foods then that I do now. It's almost like I'm still stuck in that comfort blanket of food in a way. It's your way of exerting control mm -hmm. and unfortunately it's backfiring on you. Do you feel more susceptible to colds and illnesses? Do you feel run down? Yeah, definitely. I get ill all the time, do colds you? and... Normally, I can break out in serious spots. How do you sleep? Terrible. Blood tests reveal Adam is low in folate, which you need for a healthy nervous system. 
and iron, which is important for your immune system. His vitamin C levels, meanwhile, are dangerously low. If we allow your body to run really low on vitamin C, that can lead to things like that, where your teeth drop out. Wow, that's bad. So, yeah, you wouldn't want that's that. That's through not having enough that's vitamin C. That's what we call scurvy. You read all the pirate stories about yeah. people getting scurvy because they're on a boat and they don't eat anything green or citrus. You get scurvy. How do you see the future at the moment? I think when I'm like, what am I going to be eating when I'm like 50? If you carry on eating the way you're eating, you might not get, get to, to 50. 50. You can't let whatever happened in the playground ruin the rest of your life. Yeah. It was quite a shock. I knew it in myself that it wasn't a good diet and I knew it was affecting me, but hearing someone else say it is 50 times worse. Lucy wants to encourage Adam to try at least one food he's terrified of. And as it's the texture that makes him reach for the sick bowl, she wants him to help her turn the dreaded vegetables into one of his favourites, crisps. What's the worst that can happen? Be sick. Yeah? Well, that's all right. Then we got that out in the open. <laughs> and that's fine. And, you know, we're going to make them. If you're not feeling confident enough to try them, then we'll cross that bridge when we come to it, all right? Right. A key part of overcoming a food phobia includes feeling in control of your anxiety. This is actually the first time that I've chopped a vegetable before, so... Really? Yeah. So Lucy doesn't put any pressure on Adam to taste the veg. Obviously, I know why I get nervous and panicky, but do you reckon once I've got used to, like, any vegetables that I like, that'll go in time? I think so. Mm. The more that you're exposed to it, the more it will become part of normal life. My mum used to do me carrot sticks in school. A lot of people eat carrot sticks just like that. It's a bit of crunch. Just tastes... Is there yeah, any yeah, way yeah, to yeah, spit yeah. it just out? Just spit out in the sink, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's fine, <laughs> huh? Has trying raw carrots scuppered Lucy's chances of opening Adam's eyes to the joy of vegetables? To make veggie crisps, you simply coat sliced veg in olive oil, add some seasonings such as chilli flakes and herbs, and then roast for eight minutes. Oven cooking reduces the vitamins in some of the veg, but it actually increases the count in carrots. In their raw form, some of the vitamins are locked away within the cells. Roasting releases them. I'm nervous. Are you? <laughs> yeah. I'll try this first. Go for it. That's actually... Is that... That's the carrot, carrot in it, That's yeah. the one you made. The taste's really nice. It's just the... The texture. Yeah. I think you just need to get used to new textures because you're so used to having the same things all the time that yeah. that's what your body's used to. They look nice. Try one. That's sweet Is potato. sweet potato? Yeah. Even sound more like crisps. <laughs> oh, that's nice. That's... Is it? Yeah, that's Try really one. nice. Can't believe that. So since being a little kid, this is the first time you've managed to eat and enjoy mm. vegetables. We've still got a long way to go, but yeah. you've clearly shown that you've got the balls to do it. Yeah. I think you're ready. Brilliant. I'm really proud of myself. Can't believe that I've actually tried a vegetable and I've li actually liked it. Like um, Lucy said, it's not gonna harm me trying them, so I'm actually excited. So it's kind of a big achievement. Adam leaves the food hospital determined to beat his food phobia once and for all. After three weeks on a milk-free diet, four-year-old atopic eczema sufferer Jack is paying another visit to London's St Thomas's Hospital. The only way to conclusively diagnose a food allergy is to do what's called a food challenge, and in Jack's case, means reintroducing increasing amounts of milk under controlled conditions. Mummy and Daddy are here, and we're all here, and won't let anything bad happen to you, all right? I want, and I don't want a reaction. So I'd, it'll be nice to see, so we can sort of finally put a, say that he is, yeah, he is allergic to milk. 
or if we don't, then you don't know really where to go again. Over the course of three and a half hours, they will give him larger and larger amounts of milk and monitor his reactions. So you're just going to put a little bit on your lip to begin with. Oh, thank you so much. And I'm just going to put it just in there like that. And then open your mouth for me wide. First up, a small dab on the lips. This will be a tough test for both Jack and his parents, but any discomfort will be worth it in the long run. If milk really is an allergen, then removing it from his diet could reduce his bouts of itching. Excellent, you are. Is it a bit itchy for you? A little bit. As Jack's milk dosage is upped and upped, his itching gets noticeably worse. It's definitely gone up. His itching has definitely... I think it Yeah, has. definitely. There's something going on. Yeah. And worse. <laughs> Until after 200 mils, the itching becomes unbearable. His lips start to swell and he appears to be in pain. Yeah, he's busy. <laughs> OK, right, let's get you going. I want to go home. Jack is given salbutamol to help him breathe. Oh, thank you so much. Let's have a look, Jack. Good boy, Jack. You're always a bad. Well, you're looking a lot it. better now, but unfortunately we now know that he's cow milk allergic, but obviously he had a significant reaction. Yeah. Not all eczema sufferers are allergic to milk. Other foods can be allergens too. For more information, go to the Food Hospital website. Today has sort of has helped a lot. Although we didn't want to put him in that position and expose him to something he was potentially allergic to, it's answered a hell of a lot of questions. Later, we'll find out if eradicating milk from Jack's diet improves his eczema. Ten weeks have passed since 29-year-old rheumatoid arthritis sufferer Beth came to the food hospital. With five painful joint replacements already under her belt, her condition has left her debilitated and frustrated. Lucy prescribed an anti-inflammatory high omega-3 diet, which was also designed to help her lose weight and reduce the inflammation in her body. Shaw and Lucy are curious to see if there's been any improvement. Beth, welcome back to Food Hospital. Thank you. It's been 10 weeks. How have you been? It's been good. It's been um, quite easy in terms of food mm -hmm. type side of things. That's been good. Well, Beth, I can tell you that Actually, the diet has made a change to your blood test results. When we first met you, your ESR level, the inflammatory marker in the blood, was elevated. It was over 28. Mm -hmm. And that tells us the rheumatoid arthritis is still attacking your joints. Yeah. And now your latest results, Beth, show that your ESR is in the normal range. Mm. It's 18. OK. So that means your rheumatoid arthritis activity has gone down a notch or two and that's got to be good news for the future. Yeah, that's a big shot. It's a big improvement, definitely. And I think that's a combination of the anti-inflammatory diet, but also a little bit of weight loss as well. You've lost four kilos in weight. That's over half a stone in 10 weeks. Yeah, that's right. And good. considering you've got severe rheumatoid arthritis and you really can't exercise, that's a great result. That's good progress. Yeah, definitely. So the changes that you've made, do you feel they're sustainable? Yeah, obviously today is in some ways start of doing it by myself. So, um, yeah, I've already got it in place thinking it's long term. That's really good. I'm quite shocked about the results, to be honest. Um, definitely a bigger change than I expected. I expected. I always said that if it went below 20, which is my normal range, that then I'd know if something was working. Um, so I'm really pleased that it is, <laughs> definitely. The results we've seen in Beth just go to show how powerful food can be. If she can keep up this diet, Beth may well influence the future progress of her illness. This week I'm in Portsmouth watching the time trials of cyclists cycling under the influence of one of our most beloved root vegetables, beetroot. 
Professor Andy Jones from Exeter University wants to know if the high nitrate content in beetroot juice can improve the cyclist performance on the track. These eight cyclists have each performed two time trials. One while having drunk beetroot juice, the other having drunk a placebo, which looks and tastes just the same. I definitely went harder that time. Yeah. Legs felt stronger. How did that feel? It was harder than it. last week. Okay. Definitely. Right. Yes. So, has the beetroot made a difference to their times? So, we finally, after all of that cycling and exhaustion, Andy, we've got some results. We do. So, if I hand these out, this was your time last week and today. Last week and today. The cyclists don't know which last day they had the beetroot today. and which the placebo. Last week, last week and today. Right then, Professor, tell me who had the enhanced beetroot juice. So Guy's time on beetroot was 6.28. So you went faster with the beetroot. Mark's time on beetroot was 6.42. Go. This is looking good. As the results are given out, there's a noticeable trend. So can everyone who had a better score on beetroot step forward, please? It's pretty impressive, your beetroot juice. In fact, six out of eight cyclists were faster on the day they drank the nitrate-rich beetroot juice. Although there was only um, one second difference in the time, this was a lot harder work this week right. than, um, than with the beetroot juice, so maybe okay. there is something in it. That is interesting. I've just spent a fortune on wheels as well. <laughs> <laughs> well. There you go. Research suggests that beetroot can also help reduce blood pressure, lower cholesterol and stabilise blood sugar levels too. It's exciting to think that this root vegetable packs a performance-enhancing punch. Clearly, larger trials are needed, but it seems like beetroot is going to take some beating. It's nine weeks since Jack and his parents came to the food hospital seeking help for his chronic eczema. His skin was itchy and inflamed, with weeping sores on his arms. But has cutting out milk made a difference? Today, they are returning to the food hospital to reveal the results to Gio and Lucy. Welcome back, Jack. How's your itching? Okay. It's OK. Mum and Dad, what do you think? It's a dramatic difference, definitely. So, Jack, can we have a look at you? Thumbs up. Whee! Oh, yeah. Good job. Yeah, look at that. Brilliant. I mean, it's, you know, it's still a couple of patches, but compared to last time, it was all over the back. Yeah. And it was, br it was bright red yeah. and warm to the touch. But that is amazing, I think. Oh, definitely, definitely yeah. yeah. But his eyes are so much better as well. Just the appearance of his, his face is different, isn't it? Yeah. Like, he just looks more relaxed, he looks yeah. sort of better, doesn't he? Nine weeks ago, Jack's milk allergy was causing frenzied itching, which severely damaged his skin. Jack, how do you think it is now? <laughs> Good boy. What about you guys? Have you found it sort of adjusting his his meals and things, has it been all right? The first three or four days, we, we was wondering how I was actually going to do it. We was, we was really struggling, yeah. but then just lately it seems to have got a lot easier, doesn't it? We've found a lot of ingredients and... You're getting your head round Yeah, it. definitely, yeah. But yeah, it is definitely showing, so it's worth every minute of it, even if at first it was a challenge, it's, it's getting used to it. So, Jack, what do you miss most about not, not having milk? Nothing. Nothing? <laughs> I mean, the other thing, of course, is that eczema does tend to get better with age anyway, so while you're managing it with diet right now, as he gets older, you'd expect to see his eczema get better yeah. and quite possibly being able to reintroduce dairy later on, so... Well, that's it. You may find that the food allergy disappears as he gets older as well, yeah. particularly with allergies like milk. We often see that they can disappear as yeah. time goes on. Yeah. yeah. So the future's bright. Yeah, it is definitely. <laughs> Cutting milk from Jack's diet was hard for his parents, but has had a huge effect. He's now happy and free to enjoy life like any other four-year-old. He's so much happier within himself and so much calmer. We know we still have eczema. We know we're, we're going to be able to manage that. That was the biggest thing. We couldn't manage it before. Now we feel as though we are. We're very happy. We're really, really happy. Next time, a boy whose ADHD could stand in the way of his dreams of becoming a footballer. I got a short attention span. And he'll... I just summed it up for you. I got a short attention span. An extreme eater who's turned five a day into fifty. It's a very natural way of eating, it's like a monkey, basically. It so is, yeah. yeah. <laughs>
and Lucy tries to solve the age-old problem of getting kids to eat their greens. Who here hates spinach? 